when you're under pressure, when you're like facing adversity together, it yeah. kind of bands you together and they were perfectly safe to use. Disclaimer. And you have aspirations as a person, but you don't have any ways to make it happen. No, I'm just kidding. I don't do that. A big pool of creative passion. To make something and maybe get somewhere. Yeah. And apparently it was a good enough pitch. Really felt like just hanging out with friends. When I watch them, I'm just like, oh, I'm so proud of them. Through this process of directing, producing, writing, handling all these like aspects to it, we found that we really loved it and enjoyed it. As long as I'm having fun and working on projects that bring me joy. Creating characters that people care about. No, don't cut that too. <laughs> representing the Film Industry Gateway and we are here for the WA Made Film Festival and we are going to be interviewing directors, producers, actors, audience members and so many more amazing people here in Perth. I hope you enjoy it. We're here with Mitch Hunt and Mitch you are the director of Marooned. Marooned. Tell me a little bit about the concept of Marooned and also how you came about some of the filming processes. It originated just solely from um, wanting to make a film with a pirate genre because we don't see many short films with the pirate genre. It's sort of like all done by Disney. It just was born from that and the, the want to do that. It was two weeks of writing and two days of shooting and um, everyone involved was just people I've met throughout uh, studies and school. So no, no one was paid, it was all like absolute Everyone volunteered their time. Um, but yeah, it was just a big pool of creative passion. And how long did it take you to actually film? Yeah, like straight yeah. shoot it? Um, I'd say if I had to put it into hours, probably about 10 hours. 10 hours for the whole film, yeah. And we've got some pretty beautiful beaches here in WA. Yeah. So why did you choose Cervantes? Um, it was more of a strategic location rather than um, for its beauty because I could have chosen down south, which would have been a lot nicer. But um, it was because we had um, a base of operations there. I have a mate who has a holiday house and we used that as sort of as our hub. Really useful to, for doing makeup and um, all that stuff instead of doing it on the beach. Fantastic. And if there's one part of that film that's your favourite, what would it be? When he shoots the other sailor and then he, uh, <laughs> um, the other bloke turns around and he just screams, oh, shit. <laughs> you know. Awesome. Well, it was a great film. All well done. Yeah. So I'm here with Lewis and he's an actor in Marooned. So Lewis, tell us a little bit about how it was, well, what it was like to be an actor in this film. I've acted semi-professionally a couple of years ago. Uh, I haven't done it for, for quite a while, I will say this now. Mish Hunt is a good friend of mine. I went to high school with him and he approached me and he said, look, we're trying to do a, a pirate film. And immediately I just sort of clicked with me and I went, oh, let's sign me up. It, was, it really was great. We've got a lot of sort of hobbyists if you like who, who really contributed as well so we've got um, we had somebody who took care of all of our props and all of our costume and that really lended itself to the authenticity if you like as per the you know the the location uh, that was all convenience based we we didn't really have to go too far to find a, a, a location that was suitable we just drove a couple of hours north, found Cervantes and went, this will do. And were there any challenges in regards to being in Cervantes and the beach and public and things like that? Yeah, so we, um, I've been up there a couple of times um, and the beach that we chose was probably the furthest away from the town that you could get. Um, and the idea was to find a really nice secluded sort of area of the beach where we hopefully wouldn't get that sort of interference. Um, Mitch in, in post-production obviously did a fantastic job scrubbing some things, you know, the, the local maritime traffic sort of coming back and forth when we did, you know, ocean shots and in terms of, you know, pedestrians and, and people on the beach, it wasn't too much of an issue because we were quite, as I say, we were quite secluded, you know, tyre tracks footsteps, yeah. that sort of thing. We, yeah. we were able to manage quite well. You worked yeah, that's did. Awesome. Yeah. Out of all the film, which part of it do you think was your favourite to actually do? Cinematically, I really enjoyed the, the night film. Okay. I think uh, the, the night time scene, I should say. I think it was a really important yeah. moment in the film, I suppose. But if I'm being completely honest, it was the, the sword fighting, yeah. definitely. Yeah, there's yeah, some yeah, good yeah, choreography yeah. in yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah you did um, a great job. Yeah, it was, it was fun. We had spent a couple of months sort of fine-tuning the choreography in the build-up to, to that final scene. Yeah. And then we started acting it and we went, everything that we had spent, you know, a, a decently long time in trying to, to perfect in terms of the choreography, we got to it and we went, this is about 30 seconds worth of shooting. And so we just made the rest up. And I they're real swords, so were they quite weighted? They were. 
Yeah. Apparel. We sort of had them custom made by one of our, our friends. Dulled, obviously, so they weren't sharp. They, they were perfectly safe to use. Disclaimer, <laughs> they were quite heavy. And the ones that we sort of did our practicing with were really quite light. And so when we got them, it was, it was a bit of a shock to, to use. But we adapted and I don't have to go to the gym for six weeks now. Yeah. All right. Well, Lewis, it was a great job. And yeah, fantastic film. Well done. Fantastic. Thank you. Pleasure. Hi, so I'm here with Christian and you wrote and directed the film. Um, Abeja Malagueña. And I believe it's of Spanish origin. Yes. So um, most of my family and I are Spanish born and raised, but we spend um, half of a lifetime just here in Australia. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. And how important is it to you that immigrants here have a voice in Australia? Um, to me, it's massively important because the concept of Australia was sold to me as this mingle of um, a whole bunch of cultures and then that's what I want to embody in my work because when when I walk around Perth I don't just see just Anglo-Saxon Australians everywhere I see a bunch of um, Indian Australians, Asian Australians, European Australians. I have felt that in the WA film community it hasn't been displayed as as probably as it should have so uh, I have felt like it's part of my of my uh, duty as a filmmaker to, to, to kind of like speak my voice where I can when it when it comes to this. So I, I think it's incredibly important, honestly. Yeah, and I, I hope it does that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I hope too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you, with the theme of boxing, do you have um, a history in boxing or yeah, just a passion? Uh, no, definitely. So my, my dad, growing up, was more of a... He grew up loving boxing, specifically that uh, boxing match between Sugar Ray Robinson and Rocky Marciano. Uh, but he was more of like a street scrap of being a little little, little young kid getting in trouble. Uh, my upgrowing was more like Muay Thai, a bit of boxing here and there. But we, we always enjoyed um, the competitive aspect. We're both really competitive people. Um, so I think the idea of martial arts was always ingrained in our family and in, um, in competitiveness. Like we, we found boxing to be just a really true raw way to, to, to look at competitiveness, not just violence, plus improvement and, and a bit of excitement, you know what I mean? And it was basically a whole family production, which I think is wonderful. So tell us a little bit about the filming process and how you involved your family. Um, it began with my, my dad always likes to pitch me projects when I'm doing other projects. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll do that when I can. But this was the first time when I approached them with, hey, I want to do this project with you being the lead. My partner, um, Sarah, she always DPs or gaffers all of my work. So I was like, okay, you definitely need to be part of this. She's already family anyway, so let's do it. And, and, and my mom, I always got my mom to do um, voiceover work for any paid gig that I've done, just, yep. you know, my little Easter egg here and there. So it was just getting them to, to participate in that. And, and obviously it wasn't 100%, uh, it wasn't 100% my family. I had like an extra voice actor in, in that. It was just getting them to trust me on, on this crazy adventure that film is that mo most families don't really support a lot of the times. So my, my family is amazing at supporting that. Uh, so we're just getting them like, hey, just spend a couple of hours with me in a garage, boiling hot in the middle of summer to make something and maybe get somewhere. Yeah. And apparently it was a good enough pitch. That's wonderful. And so Christian, moving forward, what are your dreams or visions with filmmaking? Uh, with filmmaking at the moment, I, um, I think I definitely found uh, that I want to work on the in immigrant Australian aspect of things. I want to make work that kind of allows immigrant Australians to have their voices uh, spoken, not just Hispanics, but also um, Australasian, you know, um, Southern Americans as well, and not a massive community here in Perth. I think after a while, after COVID has like hit, I kind of want to go back from the bigger sets as well. And that was all the fun and game before COVID hit. Everyone got affected by it. I think about uh, this time I'm looking to, to return to that. I think that's the kind of goal right now. Let's do that and be able to fund uh, these self-funded um, self projects where I can help my community as much as I can in, in that aspect, in the immigrant aspect. Well, I think your vision's wonderful and I wish you all the very best. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah. So I'm here with Clayton and Clayton, you directed and wrote, I believe, Disconnect. Yes, so I'm the writer, director and cinematographer of the film Disconnect, uh, which ju just screened at um, the WA Made Film Festival. Yeah, I really loved uh, the, the concept and actually in some ways I, it hit a little bit personally for me, the, the social media aspect of it. Explain to me how you came about it. I believe you took a break in 2022 and then came back to social media. Yeah, so um, in 2022 I took a break from social media um, and I didn't go back on until mid-2023. and. Um, Basically, I've been away for so long that I kind of forgotten how um, the whole social media world was like. 
and it was like entering like an alien universe or something like that, just because of how bizarre it was yeah. compared to how the real world works. Yeah. And I thought about making maybe like a dark comedy just to explore some of those ideas. The whole concept of pain behind getting followers, was there anything sort of that triggered you to go that angle? Well, actually, it's kind of based on another film um, by, um, I can't remember the filmmaker's name, but it's, um, the film has Juno Temple in it. It's called um, The Brass Teapot. And um, instead of um, focusing on social media in that film, they focus on money, so they um, hurt themselves and then they get like a load of cash and they have to like deal with that throughout the story. I thought um, doing a twist on that idea would be um, really fun and um, interesting. No, it was a great concept and I believe you turned it around and it, you created it in about 72 hours. Yep. Yeah, um, so we made this film as part of the Lumix 72 hour filmmaking challenge. Basically Panasonic um, put out a call for entries um, last year. They, we were selected as one of 10 teams and then they sent us all this camera equipment including their new um, Lumix S5 2X camera and then we um, made a film with it in um, 72 hours. So we started on the uh, August the 11th and then we delivered the film at 10 o'clock on the 14th of August. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah that's, that's incredible. And so moving forward from here, do you have any other visions to create more films that surround that concept of social media or where are you thinking of going next? Um, well, I don't have any explicit ideas um, to explore social media further, but um, it's definitely not off the cards. Like, um, I'm interested in uh, doing those type of social issues that affect a um, broad amount of people. So, yeah, it's um, not off the cards. Well, well done. It's, it's a great film. So I'm here with Maxim, and he is our main actor, or one of our main actors in the film Disconnect tonight. Tell me a little bit about the film and what it was like to act in this film. Oh, the, the film, it was loads of fun. Uh, the film's about sort of like social media and sacrificing oneself um, for a sort of superficial approval, mm -hmm. uh, as well as other things. Really take from it uh, what you do. Uh, it was loads of fun. It was part of a 72-hour film challenge. Yeah. Uh, so there was no script. There was nothing. It was literally like, hey, so here's the movie. Clayton and Aaron had so much prepared in no time at all within within like an hour they had to like do so much and then the next day we show up like okay here's what we're filming today uh and it was all sort of improvised and done very off the cuff uh so it really felt like just hanging out with friends and doing a little youtube yeah. video and then you see it and clayton and aaron crushed it yeah. crushed it it was so much fun oh, so good great. And did you feel like the issue actually resonated with yourself personally at all? Sort of in a post way where, strangely enough, neither Clayton nor I are on any social media. Uh, but but well it, it's great. It was really good sort of having, having that feeling of the disconnect from that issue, mm -hmm. but, uh, but also seeing it in people you know. Yeah. When you're like trying to have a conversation with someone and they're on their phone, you you just feel disconnected from like right now you're making eye contact and it's just and I'm like oh she's listening it's so nice but then when you're just chatting to someone and yeah. they just pull oh, out their phone great. and they're like wow that's so cool of you yeah. uh, oh <laughs> and did you find you were able to add some of your own humor to the film yeah yeah got got to got to play around a lot uh, which was a lot of fun uh, that there's there's one scene in particular which Clayton and Aaron fixed because it was a full straight five minutes of me and Angela, who's wonderful, just riffing about eggs. That's all we did for five minutes straight. We riffed on eggs. Every single bit of it was cut. And then Clayton and Aaron were like, what if you did this? So much better, so much better. But we got to have so much fun in between takes and the like. Everyone was so chill, but also so kind. And since they're so talented, meant that we didn't have to like stress about like, oh, are we gonna do it? They just, they're like, oh yeah, we'll do one of these angles. We'll set up a light here. And then like, like shooting for night, shooting day for night yeah. was astounding. It was like the middle of the day, but it looked like night. That blew my mind, my little yeah. baby brain. Well, it was definitely a great film and yeah, your performance was wonderful in it. So well done. Thank Thanks, you very guys. much. So Aaron, you're the producer in Disconnect. So can you tell me a little bit about what it was like and how you found a director and actors? So it was a very stressful process. So Disconnect was part of a um, Lumix 72 hour challenge. So we had 72 hours to make a short film. We found out 
that theme for the film about, I think, 11 o'clock on a, on a Friday, and we had to submit it at 10 o'clock on the Monday. Um, so we so I had to organise all the crew, hire all the crew, all the cast, source the locations, and then all prior to that event, and then basically said, we'll let you know at about 7 o'clock p.m. the day before. Wow. Um, and, yeah, we managed to pull it off. So it was a stressful process, very high uh, <laughs> energy, yeah. high adrenaline, but, um, yeah. Do you th- possibly just having that short time frame and having everyone on board and excited and motivated possibly actually helped. I think so because when you're under pressure, when you're like facing adversity mm-hmm. together, it yeah. kind of bands you together and yeah, everyone wants to sort of succeed in that common goal and and we only had probably one full day of shooting and then a half day to do any pickups. Yeah, and the rest of the time was dedicated to editing and stuff. So yeah, to have those people for a short period of time and to know that they're on their A game and they all want to succeed, I think that's, yeah, really helpful. And when it came to cutting scenes or adding bits and pieces, what helped you with that process? Um, Well, actually Clayton, the director, he went away basically as soon as he finished the film and sort of locked himself in a room to edit that. But the one constraint was that because it was a six minute time limit, there were a few things that we kind of had to cut and because it was, we didn't have a script, we only had the treatment. So if you're not able to um, have those certain story beats in because of the time limit, you kind of lose a bit of clarity in the story. Yep. So to be able to do the director's cut and show it here, we were able to watch it and yeah. see it in its full yeah. entirety. So yeah, so um, it sucked for the, the competition to cut yeah. stuff, but for this, I think people enjoyed it. And how did you go in the competition? Um, we didn't win. But the best part was being able to firstly ex- be accepted. There was yeah. 10 um, teams from across mm-hmm. Australia. Um, so to be accepted into that was flattering enough. And then to go to Sydney and to be put up there and to be part of the screening, it was really exciting. I'd never experienced that before. And Aaron, as a producer now, where are you thinking personally? Where are you going to go with filming? Well, at the moment, I am a f- work full-time in marketing at a robotics company. So producing sort of a bit of a side <laughs> hobby at the moment. I want to keep doing sort of little passion projects and work with people um, in the Perth um, film scene. It's been great to meet new people, new actors, new um, crew and stuff at this event. So yeah, work on a couple more side projects and see where the full-time work takes me. And then, yeah, I'd love to sort of finally live my dream (laughs) producing. And it is hard in WA. I think a lot of people here are directors and they're writers and they're actors, but they potentially don't have the experience actually putting something together so I feel like producing is quite in high demand there aren't a lot of producers it's a fun job but it's also a very demanding job and and you want to sort of pick projects that you know we're going to succeed so well you've done a wonderful job and yeah thanks Karen thank you very much so I'm here with Desiree and she is a co-producer of my Alpha's Lost Its Shelf and Desiree tell me what your favorite part of this film is I have got a favourite part, Um, however, there's so many kids involved um, in the film that are very, like, sort of special to me because I've been either coaching them or um, had them in my productions over the years and when I watch them I'm just like, oh, I'm so proud of them! But there's a little creative part that I love and it's when we call um, the mum, who is played by me also, um, but she calls Mrs Claus through the Christmas bauble. Uh, I like that little creative touch. But then I come back to someone like Taylor, who was Sammy in the film, and she's one of my long-term drama students and passionate little actor and the rest of the kids, and then I just... I can't really choose between them. It's just like the sections of the kids or that little bauble part. (laughs) Yeah, and I really loved the way the elves had, you know, the acrobatic background and things like that. Was there a reason you incorporated those elements? Um, That basically comes from kids that have come to me to be in my stage show productions and then we've, um, you know, slowly turned to film, um, screen, and I've learned over the time what they're capable of. So then I, I try to... Um, feature them within them. I mean, two of those acrobatic ones that were sort of flipping around actually just couldn't make it to the proper schedule. So I said, just come, see if we can fit you in. And I just chucked them in and I was like, they just flip across this flip across and then yeah it worked out it actually worked out pretty well <laughs> those two because of their little acrobat schedule so a bit of like I know their strengths and a bit of uh, they have busy schedules. <laughs> And it's tricky to get everyone together. And I believe the storyline is based off from a book or... Yeah, so I a few years ago started writing children's stories. Well, a long time ago, but more consistently children's um, stories, sorry. And, um, yeah, so I wrote a story on about, you know, the sort of popular <laughs> Christmas elf. and um, But it kind of it was a story about not 
um, but, you know, don't touch someone if they don't want to be touched. And it kind of eventuated that way. So, yeah, I, start writing, I started writing stories and then I was like, actually, I really want my stories to be films, not just books. And, yeah, we just eventuated from there. And then I um, looked for someone and found Brendan, who's got a very similar uh, imagination, maybe even better than my imagination. And, yeah, it just worked out really well. And I believe Brendan's then moving on to also creating something for Easter. Are you involved in that as well? Yeah, so that, that's another story I wrote years ago. I did publish it as a book years ago, but I'm pulling it off the shelf and I'm redoing it um, since I've sort of developed my style and sort of what I'm really capable of. Um, so anyway, it is a story of mine and I am co-producing it with him and co-directing co it with him and casting it. Um, at this stage, I'm not featuring in it. That's not my plan. It could I may end up in there in a, a suit or something. <laughs> We've got to really get moving on that yeah it's all in the process at the moment and the film's quite magical it's got that real yeah the childhood kind of feel to it um do you have a passion for these sort of holidays given that you've gone christmas now Easter? <laughs> um i think it might have just stemmed from i've been doing these stage shows i do sort of i mean i do love that sort of stuff but i have a lot of school groups come and watch my stage productions on the school holidays so i was like oh hang on a minute I could do a film, let's see if this works. And I was like, well, Christmas is coming up and let's do a Christmas film. And then it kind of snowballs at, you know, where it's almost Easter when the school holidays are on all. It's about the same time, so then you just, oh, let's just quickly do an Easter. <laughs> let's just get an Easter one together. But they are, um, does make room for magic, I suppose. And it does make room for, like, it sort of allows you to be, like, very open to stuff. And as um, a mother of two kids, I think the message that you've created of, you know, don't touch me if you don't want to be touched. I think that's super important. So, yeah, great concept. Hold well on. Thanks. Uh, I have um, two kids myself, boys. Even though sometimes the magical concepts might get a little bit lost because of my work, it's a good message, you know, for them to learn. Like as they get older, you know, they might not be. They might be sitting back, like thinking, like, oh, it's just mum's work. Like they don't want to be on the stage or on the screen or whatever. But they're listening. Hopefully, I'm making a, a good impact on. Oh, Lots of, yeah. of the future. Yeah. yeah. Well, we look forward to seeing what you create in the future. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Desiree. You. Thanks. So I'm here with Bethany, and she is the director and producer. Uh, uh, no, just the director and co writer. Director and co writer of Bye Bye Baby. And it's an awesome film that I believe incorporates a lot of surrealism. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about why you chose to uh, discuss the, the topics that you've discussed? Yeah, so. Um, I am a bisexual person, um, I'm also non-binary, and I wanted to talk about biphobia within the queer community. So looking at, I guess, like the issues that are within the queer community, not just the way that the, you know, straight communities can have issues with the queer community. I wanted to talk about that, but I wanted to talk about it in a way that wasn't super serious, because I find that sometimes you can get really bogged down in the seriousness of it and I've made a couple of films that have turned out a little depressing so I wanted to do something that was a bit more I don't know kind of funny kind of exciting but still dealt with serious topics. Yeah well I think you definitely achieved that so well done. How did you go about choosing the actors that you have in the in the film? Um, so we are limited in a way but also we get access to great actors. Um, so I'm at the WA, well, I was at the WA Screen Academy. Um, and so we use the Whopper third year actors um, and they audition essentially, but we only have a pool of like 20 or 30 so actors that we can choose from. Um, so I basically just was looking for people that embodied the characters and seemed to have fun with it um, and took direction well. And so that's how I settled on these four. And I think even though you discuss um, the issues around, you know, bisexuality and things like that, there's also, you discuss the element of bullying within the, the film. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Oh, well, for me, I've uh, struggled with being bullied before in my life. Um, and so I wanted to impart kind of like, although Romeo, who is the antagonist kind of character, is behaving in a way that isn't super appropriate, that there are a lot of reasons why he does that. And one of my big references was Queer as Folk, which I think comes through in the film. And there is a character in that who, I guess, Brian, they, they don't go super into the backstory, but you can tell that he has had situations with people before that have like affected how he feels about straight people. And so I wanted to kind of change that and have this be how um, the character of Romeo feels about other queer people. So straight people have treated him poorly and as such he lashes out at anyone who he perceives to not be queer enough. Yeah. 
Uh, wonderful. And each scene is quite different, as in you're in a different location, different setting, different hair and makeup. It's quite a lot. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into this. So tell me a little bit about how long it took and th those processes. We uh, don't have much of a choice for how long it takes. We get five days um, or four days, but you get different wow, time frames. all of that in that time. So yeah, we got five days, which was great. Last year I only got four for the film that I made. Um, but yeah, five days to like uh, have the, the shoot. Um, doing regular scheduled like 10 hour days. Um, you can't go over that. It's really important, not only for like um, the actors, etc., but also because we're students to try and emulate as closely as possible to what an actual set will be. And also to make sure we're taking care of everyone because they are students. Five days, 10 hour days, and then really short pre-production time uh, for us. Like it was only, I think we only got like maybe four weeks to kind of put it all together. And it was a lot like um, costume. We're really lucky. We're working with the Whopper costumers. So they have access to clothes. We had to get composers, etc. All of these people together, especially for this one. The music was super important. It was a lot. But well, we yeah. got it finished, which is great. <laughs> well, well done. You should be really proud. Thanks. It's um, a great film and obviously a topic that we do need to discuss more in Australia. Yeah, awesome. well done. Thanks, Thank you Bea. so much. So I'm here with Liam Bryant. And Liam, you were just in a short film. Can you tell us the name of the short film and a little bit about it? So the film that I was involved with, it's a short film that I co-directed with um, Nicola Kinane called Outstanding Young Performers. It's about two friends who have written a short film together and a little bit self-indulgent of a script, I guess. And um, they have created a party to network with other creatives, young creatives just like them. But throughout the party, they start to learn that maybe not everybody uh, likes them that much or like in, believes in them as much as they believe in themselves. And it a, was a way for us to inject a lot of ourselves into our script to, because it's a lot of um, our relatable experiences, being actors ourselves and creators ourselves, that we were able to project the kind of ideas of people we've seen in the industry, experiences we've had in the industry, like locally wise at least. And not to mention, we it was also a good platform to incorporate a lot of um, queer ideas as well, because that was important to me and important to Nicola and important to like cast a almost a queer centric film that in, like hires a diverse range of people. Definitely. And how important do you think is it at the moment that we, you know, communicate and discuss these issues in our society? I think it's right now it's more of an important topic than ever because we're at this stage, like although th there are a lot of things going on, I suppose like we've never been more open to change, I think, or in a way like we've, there's a lot of things going on, but we've never been more open to like seeing different ideas or we've had like no more than now these ideas projected into the media. And it's so great for that because within this developmental period, this is where we can see real change and through, especially through the film world, it's like being able to show it to audiences, whether it's the general public or people with influence, it's like we get to project that idea into every part of life to show that people, it's like, it's okay to be who you are, like no matter what that is, it's also okay to have a voice on topics. And like, it's okay to share that with the world in a place that hopefully in an environment that's welcome to receiving that information. Does that make sense? Definitely. And what was it like working with Nicola on this? Oh, terrible. <laughs> no, no, it was, it was amazing because yeah. Nicola and I have been friends since we did uni together in 2022. And we just like get along about literally every single thing, all of our references, all of our ideas, everything we like and everything we, everything that influences things that we enjoy is all the same and co like coexist. So I was a little bit apprehensive going into a project co-directing yeah. and co-producing and sharing everything with another person. But with Nicola, we're just so on the same page about everything because we literally just, I don't know, we just have a shared love for everything like in the craft and yeah. everything about the craft that we love is just the same. And so I couldn't have asked for a better person to do it with. And I think that shows on screen. Thank you. Yeah, it definitely you. does. Um, and so how did you go about finding a cast? Because it was a very good cast, I feel, for this short Thank film. Thank you. Yeah. I found that when what with what we were going for, we also, like I said earlier, we wanted to go with a very diverse range of people. But it was also like we like we did a, we did some public outreach with some like casting. Um, but we also were very lucky enough to, with our assistant director Zach Ingalls, he had a lot of like contacts to reach out to. And what our co-producer Sarah Legg also was like really great with giving us information and materials and resources to draw from, and people that they knew in their circles that were like people that they felt like needed to be seen in a film like this where they could, maybe people don't always see themselves in it. And so we were really like adamant on presenting that opportunity to people maybe just who don't often get a chance to play intelligent 
like layered complex characters on screen. You know what I mean? Yes. And it does have quite an interesting ending. Yes. Yes. Where you're almost cut out, I guess, yeah. moving forward. Yeah. Um, what led you to that ending? Well, well, it was like we wanted to, because this film that we've made is a proof of concept for a larger series that we're working on currently, that we're writing stuff for, and we're just pursuing pre-production, things like that. So with that, um, we wanted to do something that would leave things open for that opportunity. But we also didn't want a ending of a narrative that we felt like we'd seen or wouldn't fulfill us creatively or give us something to think about. And it gives the audience something to think about as well. So I found that we wanted to touch on that ending that because like, if they just closed it with like, oh, I'm not interested. I don't feel like that creates any com like conflicts between these two friends because it's clear that they have different priorities on this art form. And that does happen in a lot of friendships. So I thought it was important to touch on that sometimes people are willing to do what it takes to yeah. get ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And where do you see yourself personally or what will your hopes and dreams be moving forward in this industry and especially within WA? Um, well, I think it's just like to explore as many different crew roles and cast roles as I possibly can because I'm working on writing, producing, directing, and I didn't realize, because I only wrote this film with Nicola initially so that we could have a lead role to play on screen together and that we could do together because we obviously have a great chemistry and we love each other very much. I found that through this, pro like, this process of directing, producing, writing, handling all these like aspects to it, we like found that we really loved it and enjoyed it. So now I'm trying to become more of an independent artist in creating the kinds of films I want to see from myself and also just things that I'm excited to be a part of and that I find fulfilling. Because honestly, like, well, like we've all done the parts that like you had to do. It's your bread and butter. You do it. You go on with it. You get on with it and stuff. But I'm very interested in just like when I see a film in the media that I'm like, wow, I'm really inspired by that, whether it's a shot or a costume or anything like that. I just want to take that into my own art and fulfill myself artistically the best way I can. Well, Liam, amazing work. Thank you for spending the time with us Thank tonight. So and we can't wait to see where your future in the film industry goes. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. So I'm here tonight with Nicola Kinane and Elliot West and guys amazing job in your short film. Nicola can you tell me a little bit about the film and your role in it? So the film is called Outstanding Young Performers. Um, it is a production of love uh, made by myself and my best friend Liam Bryant. We were co-writers, co-directors and we were also in it as Sean and Lisa and Elliot was our wonderful actor for Eric. And the film was a product of Liam and I riding together at our time at WAPA. We filmed our showreel scene together in 2022 and from there we were like, let's expand this into a short film and, and, and see where it goes. And, and now we're here a year later after writing it. it well, it's very exciting. And you touch on some really important topics, I feel, that we need to be discussing in our society. And Elliot, tell me a little bit about your character and how you related to that character personally. Yeah, so um, my character was Eric, the very overly flamboyant gay character. This was kind of uh, my first, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, step into the film world. Before that, I'd done a lot of theatre for many years. Yeah, I met uh, Nicola and Liam through this and made some really incredible friends. I, I read the script and I was just like, yeah, I feel like I could probably do like an interesting, I don't know, like overly dramatic character, I suppose, yeah. I, it was it was a little bit out of my comfort zone for sure. Yeah, no, I learnt a lot from it, absolutely. That's, that's awesome. And Nicola, you, you mentioned that Liam being your best friend. What is it like when you're taking on a project like this with your best friend? Like, how do you go about, you know, ensuring that you come out best friends in the end? We'd already worked together before writing a three-minute showreel scene at WAPA. Basically, our version of writing together was just trying to make each other laugh as much as possible and, and find a story through the jokes and, and the banter we had between each other. So um, the short film, it just came out of a lot of writing sessions of him and I trying to make each other laugh and say, well, what if this happened and what if this happened? And just sort of finding the story within the jokes. Um, and I think it also helps that we're just very similar in our sense of humour and our values and stuff and, and what we like. So I think we have 
uh, a very similar vision for where we want this story to go. Um, so we're blessed that way. And, and creative partnerships do come with compromise and, and with um, a certain level of, of hard work, but I think we're able to make it work, him yeah. and I, so it's... You're, you're a good team. <laughs> yeah. And with the message that you're putting forward, um, what do you hope that our society will take away from that? Well, um, the short film, we're hoping to pitch it as a series. It's sort of a proof of concept for what an episode of a series about standing on performers would be like. Um, and it's funny because we're best friends in a creative partnership talking about why it's not good to be a, in a partnership with your best friend, which is funny. Um, but we also very much... I mean, we're both queer artists and we play queer characters and we don't want to put it in a way where we're explaining it to an audience. We just want to be authentically ourselves and, and make people be used to that. So I think that's a big part of the story as well. So um, when we're stuck in writing and stuff, we just always bring it back to being ourselves and bringing it as close to who we are as possible and, and that's how we make it work. Yeah. yeah, and it makes it more relatable for the audience too, I'm sure. Elliot, as Eric, um, you obviously said you grew as, you know, a person with that character. Where do you hope to see yourself moving forward as an actor from now? Yeah, so um, I've had uh, uh, the uh, opportunity to... Uh, so this was my first uh, step into the film industry and because of this I've met so many incredible people and I've actually been able to uh, participate in, in even further uh, projects that are just absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, just recently we wrapped up another short film with the Cotton Film Society and that was my first time uh, exploring a role as a lead uh, um, in, in, a, in a film space. Um, yeah, I just hope this brings more opportunities like that. I feel like I'm learning more every time and it's just, it's really, really enjoyable, yeah. And Nicola, how did you go about finding Elliot? And what was your process in, you know, sourcing your cast? Um, so we sourced our cast basically through taking advantage of all of the wonderful actors in Perth, Facebook groups, just making up a little banner in Canva and then sharing it on social media and just getting friends and, and people we knew but also people we did not know um, to audition and, and just to see who was the most authentic fit for each character. Elliot was recommended to us by our lovely friend Sarah Legg, who was our co-producer on this film. Uh, her and Elliot know each other from school, and she was like, I have someone for Eric. Do not fret, you will find your Eric. We were struggling to find our Eric. Okay. And she was like, I'll get him to send in a tape. And Liam and I watched Elliot's tape, and we were like, that is perfect. He's perfect, and we want him involved. And so we auditioned everyone, and through even people we already knew who were great just to find the right fit and yeah I think we've casted pretty well right. I'm very proud yeah. yeah definitely and as you should be well thank you both so much and I am excited for both of you as to where your features are going to be heading and we'll keep an eye out for what you are doing in the future and all the best Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. So we're here with Haseeb and he is the director of Hope This Will Fix Me. And Haseeb, do you mind telling us a little bit about your role with this film? Uh, yes, I uh, was the producer and the uh, director and a co-writer, a co-screenplay writer. All right, and when you uh, were presented with a script from Claire, what sort of things are you looking for in a script that make you go, yeah, I like the look of this the script? Uh, I just kind of go with my gut if it's something that I want to work with and I spoke very direct and honest with her about I would only get on board if this changes to fit my style and for me it was really it was too stupid it was too perfect of a script when I first saw it and I was like I just need we need to add some flaws here some stuff needs to go wrong here and whether it's like my style or not who knows it's too early to tell but I, yeah, I was just looking to see most importantly like if it sticks to me, and secondly, like how passionate or what kind of person is this, the writer? That's wonderful. And as a director, what sort of style do you think you have? Very chaotic. Yep. Very, but this one is not necessarily um, a representation of chaos. It's um, my personally, I think chaos is kind of what kind of 
drives me to make content or and I think it naturally kind of unfolds like the party scene I don't want to spoil stuff but it doesn't go well I kind of wanted to kind of have like a moment where things start spiraling and happening quick yeah well that's always fun <laughs> what was this team like to work with like, what was the most enjoyable element uh, the professionalism when people always expect there to be lots of bloopers especially crew wise but for us we were so go mode that there was no room for bloopers. Maybe there was one or two that I could think of, but I, so my, my favorite part was on set, everybody was like like so driven and passionate to make themselves useful or, or be proactive. So the, to me, that's it, yeah. Yeah, and as a director, how do you think you grew with this film? Or what part of you do you think, yeah, how did you grow as a person? Uh, well, definitely as a person, working on somebody else's project allowed me to uh, develop as a as a collaborator uh, my post-production knowledge became like way better you no know, understanding how much time you need for sound design for sound editing for scoring for the editing itself in terms of editing i was working with hamza he was the person that was uh the, the lead editor and this is the first time last one i worked was just me and if you look at the project management it's a disaster it's like a can of worms, you know? But this time Hamza taught me how to uh, properly manage uh, a file of a feature length, how to organize everything. And the amount of time, hours and hundreds of hours we spent just on organizing and making sure everything is perfect from a technical aspect. Bunch of long-winded, boring stuff. That's okay. I mean, it's all personal growth. That's yeah, great. yeah. And tell us a little bit more about um, Dolly Lama Productions and your involvement with that. Yeah, we started about like four years ago now, and it's just a group of filmmakers that we met at TAFE. And I was like, hey, let's make films together, short films. We started making 15 in a semester, then 10 uh, short films in the next year. Uh, we had two screenings at Luna, and then we kind of started, like, you know what, let's make a feature. And we're, we're not ready, we're ready. And we made a feature, and it was like our own film school. And now uh, Claire came up to us and asked to do a feature and I did and now we have a couple of local artists that are, we're developing feature scripts so we're definitely going to be like next year WMA and we're going to be here with at least one feature film right now we're shooting a TV web series pilot called the pregame that's about alcoholism in your early 20s and childhood trauma how that correlates to that uh, we're doing a reality TV web series called life in Leaderville, uh, which we, we have three episodes out already on YouTube uh, so we're Dalai Lama right now, we're just about people coming to us with ideas and just making it happen. We have a team of producers that are like passionate to invest their time for the long run, which is hopefully, you know, like we get the content out and we monetize it through a uh, platform that we're creating, which is Dalai Lama Productions. So what we do is just we try to make dreams come true and it doesn't have to be on like this celebrity uh, status. It can just be like on this like actual authentic level. So. Yeah, that's fantastic and um, an incredible vision there. Um, and where do you see yourself going as a director moving forward or what sort of, which part of the industry do you really want to dive into? Well, right now I'm really focused on uh, producing my um, web series that I wrote four years ago, seven episodes. And I just started, I just fi finished filming episode one last weekend. And right now we're on pre-production of episode two, which we've done in March. Uh, that one really speaks to me because it's based off my early 20s, which was pure chaos, you know, and you have aspirations as a person, but you don't have any um, ways to make, your, uh, to make it happen. You're stuck in your own ways. I want to be a filmmaker, but instead you're an alcoholic who's just, you know, going out with your friends every night because that right now is I'm most passionate about. There's a feature film that um, I'm in pre-production of that I want to release in 2025. I want to make the web series while I'm doing the reality TV series as a hobby, while I'm making feature films as like the, I'm never making a feature film again that's so rushed. Okay. Because I believe I need to take time and develop. Because now I feel like I have enough to find money for development. So there's some opportunities, hopefully, fingers crossed, work hard, head down, and it'll come through. Definitely, well, there's some exciting things ahead yeah. and we look forward to watching to see where you go and how you grow and we wish you all the best. All right, thank you so thank much, you. Sam. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm here with Claire Wesley, who is from I Hope You Will Fix Me. And Claire, you have a huge role in this film. Tell us a little bit more about your role and what elements, I guess, you've been involved with. Um, so for this particular project, I wrote it and executive produced and I acted in. Yeah. Um, 
which was a crazy experience. Like all of it has been just amazing, and I'm so like grateful to have been a part of the journey. Um, this is my first feature film, um, and yeah, no, it's just been such a positive experience that I want to do more. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different roles that you played out of all of them. Did you have a favourite? Ooh, good question. Um, so I think that my favourite my favorite is acting, because I love to act. Yeah. Second favourite is, it's a close second, but it's definitely like screenwriting. I don't know, you just get like a, like a deeper understanding of the whole script and like all of the characters and your own character's motives. You just feel so much more involved with the project and it's a really special thing to be so involved. Yeah. yeah. And do you play the character of Anise in this film? How much of her role do you relate to personally? Um, good question. Um, I think I can definitely relate to a lot of aspects of Anise and I think that what I find helpful when I approach acting roles as well is I love to find bits of the characters that I can relate to, use that to help like grow my character. So it seems more like a three-dimensional character rather than two-dimensional. I think it's definitely, like, Anise is, like, a very special character for me. She sort of represents some of my insecurities. She's got a bit of a caterpillar to butterfly story. Yeah, yeah, so I think that that's a really nice thing to go through, like, even performing as her, because you still go through a little bit of that when you're creating the character in your own head. Mm. Um, so you yourself are really, a little bit released after acting a character like that. Yeah. Definitely, and I think a lot of people watching that film would relate to this film in some way, shape or form. It's got a lot, to, um, it talks a lot about resilience and perseverance and there's a lot of underlining you know, tones of different messages in there. Did you mean to have that or? It's definitely a very layered script. Um, there were a lot of themes that we wanted to include in the script and I think that um, like putting them in but in a more subtle way was a great way to like do a very broad sweep that meant that lots of people could relate to all of the issues and it didn't like diminish any issues as being less important or anything like that, yeah. And as a young individual, how much growth do you think you've made with this film? I feel like I have had just like so much growth yeah. through this entire process, just not just professionally but also in myself. I feel like I've had such a shift in the way that I see the world and how I approach in acting, as like how I approach performing as a character in acting, and how I approach team projects, everything. My writing's gotten better, my acting's gotten better. It's just been such a like a catalyst for moving forward for me. Yeah. Well, you've done an amazing job with I Hope This Will Fix Me. Where do your dreams, goals, ambitions, what are they for the future for you personally? Well, I, I've i discovered my love of um, screenwriting, so I definitely want to write more projects. Um, I have been writing a few projects. I've written about three or five and there's only one of them that I like so far <laughs> but that's the life of a writer um, and I think that I'd love to produce and act in another project that I've written um, but I'd love to act in other people's projects as well because I love just in general like the group collaboration process um, so yeah anything that is coming up that has me to help them manifest their dreams yeah definitely and you were pretty brave in the way you approached to see Ben you know Dolly Lama Productions to to take on this film for you. What would your message be to any young individual wanting to, you know, take on this process themselves? Just do it. Quite often you can get caught up in your own head and think that, like, what if it doesn't do this? What if it doesn't do that? You don't know until you try. So just try. You are the master of your own destiny, so you need to take the steps, reach your goal, and it's definitely achievable if you put your mind to it. Yeah. Well, Claire, you've done an amazing job. You should be very proud. And it's been a pleasure to meet you, so thank you. It's been so nice. So I'm here with Vanessa Cups, and you are here tonight to support Dalai Lama Productions. Can you tell us a little bit about your background with them and, yeah, why you came to support them tonight? Yeah, so um, I actually met um, Hasib and James and Nitsan, who wasn't here tonight, um, a few years ago, Cert 3 TAFE um, film production class, and that's where Hasib and James had the idea to form Dalai Lama Productions, and then brought me on as an actor and everything, so we just started collaborating, became friends, and just um, support each other. I was in America when they were filming this, so I couldn't jump on any of the 
smaller roles, but love them all and just wanted to support. So was blown away by the film today. <laughs> and what part of the film of I Hope This Will Fix Me was your favourite? Yeah. Oh, I mean, to nail down a specific part um, will be hard, but I was blown away by all the acting and the production design and the costuming and just and the color grading. It was just a stunning visually. You're just like soaking it in. But um, probably the party scene, I'm sure a lot of people are saying that just because the band was incredible and it was a really cool party scene and just beautifully shot and lit and everything. Yeah. And you mentioned you're an actor. So what is your past for that one? Where, what are you currently doing at the moment? Um, so I was in Rampage Electra last year that um, screened at WA Made Film Festival that Hasib um, wrote and directed and okay. part of Dalai Lama Productions. And so um, I've got a few things in the works right now, but um, actually just shot a kind of pilot for um, a pilot with um, Hasib yesterday um, for like a film podcast and then a film review um, YouTube show. So that's kind of in the works right now. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. And as like a young person from Perth, if you're trying to get into the film industry, what would you say to them? Well, hopefully everyone said this, but yeah, just believe in yourself, show up and just, yeah, meet as many people as you can, go out there and network. And, you know, the networking word sounds a little scary, but it's really just going and yeah. just meeting people. And then you find you connect and you're like, oh, and, and actually connect on a, a genuine level and meet people you want to work with. And I feel like that's the way to go. And personally for you, what would you be your ultimate dream and goal in this industry? My kind of goal and dream has always just been to, as long as I'm having fun and working on projects that like bring me joy, like that to me is like winning. So I get to do that and meet amazing people and work with them. And yeah, that's, I get to do that. So I feel really, really happy about it. <laughs> oh, Vanessa, thank you so much for coming tonight. It was so lovely talking to you and we wish you all the best with your career as thank well. You. Thank Thanks you so much. Thanks. So I'm here with Brit and she has a significant role in the film, yeah. Hope This Will Fix Me. Well, Brit, tell us a little bit about your role. So I play Anise Saunders, the lead character of I Hope This Will Fix Me. No, I'm just kidding. I don't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I play a very small role on camera, which I forgot about until someone asked me if I was in the film when we got here today. I was like, as a matter of fact, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Because when you put in so much time behind camera, you're just like, I just need a little moment in front of it. Um, but no, I took on the role of production designer um, and wardrobe for, I hope this will fix me. And that is a significant role. And some of those outfits were really, they were great. They were, oh, thank yeah, you. yeah, definitely. So tell us a bit about what it's like to be a production designer. Being a production designer, I don't know what that means in the element of the production design world and the film world, but I know in terms of how I apply it to film, it is pretty much trying to bring life to the scene in a way that it's storytelling through color and texture and just makes it a little bit more interesting for um, the audience to watch. So I try to make it not too distracting, um, that you're only paying attention to what's happening in the background. But it's like, I have a saying before I was a production designer that you don't notice when it's clean, but you notice when it's dirty. Yeah. So keep it clean <laughs> and don't make it dirty. So on either end of that, yeah, clean it up. Not too much, not too little, just right to make it hard. <laughs> yes, it was quite a tricky job to do. When it comes to your role, you have a budget. How does that restrict you in some ways or what freedom do you have with that? When it comes to budget in indie film, that's interesting because you do have to try and decide what's important. Um, I recently learned this element called hero props or hero wardrobe uh, where you actually need that because it's written into the script. Apart from that, so once you have that covered, it's like where is the money going and trying to see where you can stretch your penny in order to to make like a harmonious scene because you can't focus on one thing, for example, furniture and then not have anything else. So if you, <laughs> I think if you aspire to be in our department, you kind of have that inkling, I guess, that it's 
when you look around, you see there's lots of elements involved and trying to incorporate all of them on such a tight budget can be part of the fun, can also be a little bit stressful. <laughs> Definitely. And within this film, what was your favorite scene to costume or do set design for? All of them. Oh, I love all of them. Exterior shots to me are a blessing in disguise, but at the same time I get a little bit disappointed that I can't be so involved because it's like, and then I try to be like, what if we like shot at this angle and got like that flower in the background just to like compensate and like mark my territory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but at the same time, exterior shots are a really, actually going back to your previous question, exterior shots are a really great way to cheat an indie film budget because you're not having to fill an interior space. Obviously the camera department will say and lighting department will say there's a whole lot of other problems involved but really keeps the budget low. <laughs> it's really important to then focus on the wardrobe for the exterior scenes um, since that's kind of like a really small element that you can bring to the table in that department. No, sorry. That's a small element that you can bring to the table in that scene. In terms of interior scenes, I'd still try to balance the wardrobe and the production design together and make it harmonious, keyword. All thanks to lots of tips from my beautiful fellow cinematographer teammates who have guided me in the right direction to do so. My quote is texture, texture, texture when it comes to wardrobe. So just finding those pieces that have like structural integrity and translate well on film. Yeah, and I think it definitely did do that. So well done. Thank you. <laughs> and um, for any young Perth individual or young Australian that, you know, is wanting to be a part of the film industry and particularly maybe looking at production design, what steps did you take to get there? And what would you recommend for them? Okay, that's a really hard question because I think in... Wow. Yeah. Film, like the way I stepped into film seems like that's how no one else stepped into film. But when you start networking and talking to people, you're like, oh, this is how everyone got into film. Like you yeah. just, you were interested, you found a group of like-minded people, and then you found your part on the team. Um, so that's kind of the broad way of doing it. The finite way of doing it is <clears throat> own a hatchback. So that's super helpful um, because you need to move a lot of <laughs> product. That is not insinuating drugs. <laughs> you, no. <laughs> um, so you need to <laughs> get yourself a hatchback because you can fit lots of stuff in it and you got to move stuff between sets um, and eventually one day work your way up to a truck and trailer. I'm not there yet. Check out my GoFundMe page. No, don't cut that too. Um, <laughs> did you um, go a TAFE pathway, a uni pathway, or did you just like meet people, step oh, into it, network? Like... Yeah, I went into a font my creative colors and eventually I found the right group of people. I was hoping to actually get into a creative role, not in film. I was more looking at doing photography interiors or travel or anything along those lines and I just so happened to stumble across a great team of filmmakers and when I saw their incredible enthusiasm and work I literally was like the only thing missing is fairy dust so let me get in there and help you guys out. I've learned more than they have with me they would probably disagree but yeah for me it was just finding a group of people who I, like I you know yeah. fit in with the team and take an opportunity and run with it I love it and yes oh that's called networking yeah <laughs> so and, answer your question and lastly where do you hope this direction will take you in years to come that's a great question that I genuinely cannot answer because <laughs> I am just going to take it one project at a time and by that I mean four projects at a time we have four projects lined up this year it's just it's for me for this year that's a great fit whatever happens in the future you guys know where to find me <laughs> well Brett amazing work it's been a pleasure meeting you and wonderful work in this film and all the best for the future Thank you so much. I'm here with Susie, and Susie, you're an audience member for tonight. Uh, which film did you come to watch specifically? I hope this will fix me. Yeah. And uh, I believe you're friends with one of the cast members, or what was their involvement in this film? Claire, yeah, the writer and um, lead. Yeah, she played the lead. Yeah. Um, yeah, Claire 
Wow, amazing. Um, as a friend, how proud of her are you? <laughs> I'm super proud. Wow, I'm blown away from yeah the script and the acting, everything like the whole journey she did through this whole production. It's been really inspiring for me yeah. to watch from the sidelines as a friend. Obviously, this has been a dream of hers. Being able to see that come into reality, how does that feel for you? It feels great. Yeah, as I mentioned, like it's really inspiring. Inspiring, and for me as well as a filmmaker, it really. Um, helps me to like see what I want to do in the future and what I can achieve like yeah. so close to me someone is achieving some something so amazing and yeah. that really inspires me to just like go for my goals as a writer and director yeah and I think within that film there was a lot of underlining tones of you know resilience and perseverance wow. and was there any of that that you actually related to yourself 100 percent like <laughs> I think we all do. I think we all do. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, Anis, Anis is a really interesting character because I do think most of us can, like, reflect ourselves in her in one way or another. Everyone has insecurities, and I think that's also a really big reason why the film is so compelling to watch because all of us has that sense of insecurity in some way and everyone can relate to it. So, yeah. Now, Cesar, you mentioned that you're a filmmaker. What sort of things have you done so far to get to that point and what are your dreams and goals moving forward as a filmmaker? Yeah, so I am, I'm studying screen production and Claire was actually the lead in my most recent short film. Okay. Um, and I have been, like, apart from the projects that I'm doing at uni. I've been doing, yeah, my uh, project outside of uni to really try to reach my goals. And I'm also shooting my other short film at the moment. Um, so I'm both trying to work in my, in my course with the projects, but also outside to kind of work as much as I can towards the goal, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming along tonight and yeah, supporting our film industry and being a part of it too. And we'll definitely be on the lookout for you and where your journey goes as a filmmaker too. So thank you, Susie. Thank, yeah. thank you so much. So hi, James. Hello. You are an audience member here tonight. Yes. So tell me a little bit about uh, which film was your favorite and why? So my favorite was, um, what stood out to me was um, disconnect a lot. Yeah. Uh, so I knew the I know the cast briefly, uh, met them before, and they told me a lot about it. And it, those issues are, like do raise in our um, community, and um, it, it happens in everyday life with um, social media taking over people's lives. And I found that I learned a lot from just seeing the film as well, and it's so insightful. And I have mates that have dealt with depression or. Mm -hmm. um, you know, been really drained um, from these different issues. So being able to watch that film and seeing like talented people like themselves take on these creative roles, it's it's pretty inspiring. Yeah. So, and I like being an actor myself. I'm just taking those mental notes and yep. thinking what I can input into my next projects and stuff. So. Yeah, and being yeah. an actor yourself when you're watching these films. Yeah. Are there certain things that jump out at you, or you reflect on, or think? Yeah. What what goes through your head? Yeah. So even just the psychology of the actor, like. Yep. If, it's sometimes hard to, you know, be, be in that psychology of the character. Um, it takes a lot of b breaking down of the script and um, networking is very important as well. Um, but I found that, yeah, just, just looking at the emotions and the, the, um, even just the gestures, expressions yeah. of the character, really like you can see some different, different uh, perspectives upon the characters and how they can implement that. And so I, I haven't done that before. I'll do that next time, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So. That's great, James. And also being an actor and social media yep. and Disconnect being your favourite, did you find that, that maybe that's, did that resonate because of that? Um, definitely, yeah. So there was, being an actor, I, I think that those issues are raised more and more. Uh, and as an actor, you have to step out of your comfort zone a lot of the times as well. And being in those, um, those different characters, it can be a lot of pressure and a lot of responsibility. So... Um, I guess it's more just balancing out your, your everyday and just focusing on what's important in life. And I've noticed that with these roles, you're going to have a lot of pressure. You're going to have a lot of um, problem solving skills that you have to overcome. But it's more staying focused in on what's important in the, in the, in the creative process and just being, being yourself, being friendly um, and just, yeah, making sure you're doing the right thing on set and, yeah, being, being 
something authentic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, aside from Disconnect, were there any other films that were maybe a highlight for you and why? Yeah, so this is my second day being here, so <laughs> I was able to have the opportunity to see the other projects yesterday, but yep. from today, remind me the girl that she had, um, she was being drugged by her husband. Delusion. Just focusing on, yeah, yep. delu delusion, yeah. So that one was really important. I'd like, I've done a lot of projects in school where we focus on youth social issues yeah. like that, domestic violence and other, other issues like that. So I, yeah, I was able to kind of uh, like, it was able to eye-opening, eye I guess, in a way. And yeah, yeah, that, yeah. And you do, do have a lot of sympathy for people out there that may be going through those troubles and you just recommend they open up and um, allowing actors to step into those um, different shoes is also yeah. very, um, not only informative, but it's also eye-opening and you can spread the spread awareness wherever you can. Um, but yeah, we're very talented characters there and um, I'm excited to see what they're all up to next. Yep. So, well, James, as an actor, we're excited to see where yeah, you go. And you. Yeah, it was and great I'll... having you in the audience tonight. Yeah, so. it's a pleasure being here. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm here with Jason Robert Lester. And Jason, would you be able to tell us a little bit about what you do in the film industry at the moment? Uh, well, I'm mostly a director, but I'm also moving into acting. So um, most recently played a uh, bad guy in a horror movie. For, so it's my first really big role in a film. So I'm um, happy to, to kind of yeah, explore the, the acting side of things as well as behind the camera as well. And your experience in directing, what sort of films have you created previously? Do you have a favourite? So of the films that I've done, um, I've got a film in this very festival screening uh, on the uh, horror film showcase. It's called Sudden Death. Uh, it was a lot of fun to make. We made that for a um, timed challenge, a 48-hour film challenge, uh, to make a three-minute film in wow. 48 hours. So uh, that's screening tomorrow night. Oh, that's so exciting. And how much planning would go around creating a film like within a 48 hours? Well, we really don't have a lot of time. We get the... Uh, items, the essential items at the beginning of the competition uh, and then we've got yeah 48 hours from inception to completion so yeah it's a lot of fun to do yeah. I can imagine and horror seems to be your genre, you like horror? I'd say more than half the films I've done are horror, I'd like to do lots of different kinds of things but horror seems to be the the one that kind of keeps drawing me back uh so yeah sometimes you you go with it and sometimes you try to try uh try to do different things and when you're directing what's your favorite part of being a director i think my favorite part i've got two favorite parts one is to talk, talking to writers about story and kind of where they can take their script and, and how to improve it. And the other is talking to actors about how they can develop their characters and uh, work out who they are and what they're all about. And you're moving into acting. What sort of character do you feel like you would be able to portray really well? I think the idea behind acting is to explore things that you don't do in your normal life. I, I did a, a play where I played a, a character very similar to myself, which was fun. I kind of learned a lot about myself. And then I did this horror movie uh, where I played a complete psychopath, completely opposite to myself. And then kind of the way of doing it, sort of letting the character kind of take over during, you know, during takes and, uh, and then come back to me when they call cut. <laughs> And for the genre of horror, are there certain elements or things that you look at or try to take on to really get the audience captured by that? Well, I think the idea is all about um, creating characters that people care about and putting them into situations that they couldn't you know, exist in, they couldn't uh, uh, survive themselves. So I think... I think that's the element of, of, of horror is sort of it's about building tension and um, and finding a release for that. And now you've been a part of the film industry here in Perth for a long time. So what are you most excited about for film in Perth at the moment? There's probably two coexisting things happening in Western Australia at the moment. First of all, the kind of films that we've seen here at WA made. Um, lots of young filmmakers, people making their first films, people making short films. And the other side of it is attracting overseas people. We've seen Nicolas Cage, we've seen Sam Neill, we've got uh, Daisy Ridley, all of these kind of big names kind of coming to our state 
uh, to shoot and it's giving uh, a lot of um, local filmmakers kind of the experience of working on, on bigger projects, which is fantastic. Yeah, that's wonderful. So exciting times ahead. And yeah, thank you for talking to us. And yeah, we wish you all the best with your future acting as well. Thank you so much. So I'm Samantha and... I'm Ethan Powell. And we were here tonight for the WA Film Festival and we got to see a series of um, short films. Um, Ethan, what was your favourite? It's a hard one. I did like Delusion. I thought the acting that was phenomenal, especially yeah. the lead. Like, as an actor, your eyes, you know, tell the story. And yeah. I felt like she was very powerful in that performance. But also like the last one, because that was just hilarious how people go through all this pain to try and get, you know, yeah, yeah it, was, it was very fun. Yeah, I would have to agree. The same two resonated with me uh, for various reasons. Um, now, you're an actor too. Yes. So when you were looking at these films, what were you also thinking about as an actor? I was thinking about what's the technique they're using to stay in these characters, you know, because I feel like acting is very psychological, but then also everyone has their own way of doing their own unique way of getting into character. So when I watch a film, like, okay, what's this person thinking of? How do they get into yeah. this character, you know? It's all of that stuff you don't hear about when you become an actor. Yeah. And of which of the films do you think the costuming was maybe the best? Costuming, probably Bye Bye Baby. Okay. I mean, that was... Yeah, there's a lot of scene changes in that And one. the lighting in that was yeah. awesome as well. And, Definitely had the best costumes, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the choreography of the sword fight, Marooned. Did you want to be in that sword fight? Oh, I definitely <laughs> want to be in that sword fight. I've been in a fight before, like that was choreographed, and that was a lot of fun, yeah. but sword fight, man, that, that would be sick, hey. So I'm joined by the lovely Samantha. You all know her behind the camera. <laughs> so, Samantha, what was your favourite film tonight and why? Oh. Uh, that's a tricky one. I really loved Hope This Will Fix Me. And the reason being is I guess I could relate in some way, shape or form to Anise and just a story of perseverance and resilience and having this dream or goal, but holding back for the sake of, you know, either the abandonment, which was one of the main issues in this film, or, um, yeah, for the sake of family. And that would be why that's my, hmm. my favourite. And what do you think about the runtime? Because it was less than an hour. Do you think they did very well with the pace of the film? Definitely. Uh, I think if it had been any longer, it may not have actually hit the storyline as well as it did. And I think you might have got a little bit lost or bored, whereas I think it, you were really captivated by the length of this film. Two films were awesome. And let's talk about the first one, because it's quite similar in that way, but I thought it was really very good for this Lampe. What did you think about the first film? The first film, um, I would say, has issues that we need to talk about in our society at the moment, and that a lot of people are going through and... It's great to see that people are starting to become brave enough to bring those issues to the forefront. Mm. Did you have an awesome time watching both? Definitely. Love watching all the films within the WA Made Film Festival. Um, and I'm really excited about the talent that we're seeing here. Now let's talk about last weekend, so you didn't get interviewed then. What was your favourite short from last weekend, if you still remember? Oh, I had a couple, <laughs> delusion and disconnect um, from a personal point of view because they were topics I related to, but Maroon was just hilarious. I found that really, <laughs> um, really great and I loved the choreography that was in that. So, yeah, I didn't just have one favourite. I couldn't really just yeah. pick. Yeah. All amazing. Yeah. It's, it's been amazing, WMA. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. And how have you found interviewing all these directors and actors? Was it come off naturally or was it a challenge? Uh, well, yes, I would say it comes off naturally. I just love having a conversation with someone and getting to know them and learn more information about them. And that's been my favourite part of interviewing all these amazing people. And that's it on Samantha, the lovely Samantha from Studio and Camera. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we've had a great night here at the WA Film Festival. So. It was awesome. Yep. Thanks, Aidan, for this opportunity. And thank you, everyone, for coming to WA Made. Yeah, definitely. And we're excited to see where the film industry is going to head in WA. Oh, yeah, it's getting bigger. Big things coming. Big things coming. Yeah. <laughs> thank you to everyone involved in this amazing festival. And the film industry in, in Perth in particular is looking exciting.